Chapter 2 The Evolution of the Shadow Edward C. Whitmond The term shadow refers to that part of the personality which has been repressed for the sake of the ego ideal. Since everything unconscious is projected, we encounter the shadow in projection, in our view of the other fellow. As a figure in dreams or fantasies, the shadow represents the personal unconscious. It is like a composite of the personal shells of our complexes and is, thus, the doorway to all deeper transpersonal experiences. Practically speaking, the shadow, more often than not, appears as an inferior personality. However, there can also be a positive shadow, which appears when we tend to identify with our negative qualities and repress the positive ones. The following example is of the shadow is a classical one from a familiar situation. A middle-aged patient complains repeatedly and bitterly about her mother-in-law. Her description seems by and large to be correct and adequate for her husband, independently of his wife, has provided a description which is practically identical. Mother is seen by both as utterly domineering, never able to admit another person's viewpoint in the habit of asking for advice and, at once, deprecating it, always feeling at a disadvantage, abused, martyred, and, as a result of all this, almost impossible to reach. Our Annalise Sunt, the daughter-in-law, feels that her mother-in-law stands between her and her husband. The son must constantly serve his mother, and the wife, consequently, feels eclipsed. Her marital situation seems to be in a hopeless impasse. She has the following dream. I'm in a dark hallway. I attempt to reach my husband, but my way is barred by the mother-in-law. What is most frightening, however, is that my mother-in-law cannot see me, even though a spotlight shines brightly upon me. It is as if I do not exist at all, as far as she is concerned. Let us remember again that a dream always points to an unconscious situation. It is complementary and reveals that which is not sufficiently within the field of our awareness. A dream will not restate a situation which the dreamer already sees adequately and correctly. Where there is doubt in the conscious mind, a dream may help to resolve that doubt by reiteration. But whenever a dream repeats something of which we feel utterly convinced, a challenge is thereby raised by the unconscious. Our projections are held up to us. On the surface, this dream seems to confirm the daughter-in-law's conscious complaint. But what does it say when we look for an unconscious projection? It tells the dreamer one thing quite clearly. The spotlight is upon you and not on your mother-in-law. It shows her the unconscious qualities which she projects upon her mother-in-law and which stand between her husband and herself. The mother-in-law in her prevents her from reaching her husband. It is her own necessity always to be right. Her tendency to create obstacles and deprecate everything and her tendency to be the great martyr which stand in her way. The spotlight is upon her, but the mother-in-law does not see her. She's so gripped by and identical with the qualities ascribed to the mother-in-law, that she is unable to see herself as she does. As she is, to see her own real individuality. As a result, her own individuality is as good as non-existent, and since she cannot see herself truly, she also cannot, in real life, see her mother-in-law as a human being and therefore cannot deal adequately with the obstructionist tactics which she indeed does use. This is a perfect vicious cycle which inevitably occurs whenever we are caught in a shadow projection or in an animus or anima projection.
a projection invariably blurs our own view of the other person. Even when the projected qualities happen to be real qualities of the other person, as in this case, the effect reaction which marks the projection points to the effect toned complex in us, which blurs our vision and interferes with our capacity to see objectively and relate humanly. Imagine an automobile driver who unknowingly wears spectacles of red glass. He would find it difficult to tell the difference between red, yellow, or green traffic lights, and he would be in constant danger of an accident. It is of no help to him that some, or for that matter, even most of the lights he perceives as red really happen to be red. The danger to him comes from the inability to differentiate and separate what his red projection imposes on him. Where a shadow projection occurs, we are not able to differentiate between the actuality of the other person and our own complexes. We cannot tell fact from fancy. We cannot see where we begin and he ends. We cannot see him. Neither can we see ourselves. Ask someone to give a description of the personality type which he finds most despicable, most unbearable and hateful, and most impossible to get along with, and he will produce a description of his own repressed characteristics, a self-description which is utterly unconscious, and which therefore always and everywhere tortures him as he receives its effect from the other person. These very qualities are so unacceptable to him precisely because they represent his own repressed side. Only that which we cannot accept within ourselves do we find impossible to live with in others. Negative qualities which do not bother us so excessively, which we find relatively easy to forgive, if we have to forgive them at all, are not likely to pertain to our shadow. The shadow is the archetypal experience of the other fellow, who in his strangeness is always suspect. It is the archetypal urge for a scapegoat, for someone to blame and attack in order to vindicate oneself and be justified. It is the archetypal experience of the enemy, the experience of blameworthiness, which always adheres to the other fellow, since we are under the illusion of knowing ourselves and of having already dealt adequately with our own problems. In other words, to the extent that I have to be right and good, he, she, or they become the carriers of all the evil which I fail to acknowledge within myself. The reason for this lie within the very nature of the ego itself. The development of the ego takes place as a result of the encounter between the self, as a potential personality trend, and external reality, that is, between inner potential individuality and outer collectivity. On the first level of experience between right and wrong, which is the basis for self-acceptance, the beginnings of conscience are vested in and projected onto the other collectively. The child accepts himself in terms of fitting in. Harmony with the self and thus with conscience appears at first to be dependent upon external acceptance, that is, upon collective and personal values. And those elements of the individuality which are too much at variance with accepted persona values cannot, seemingly, be consciously incorporated into the image which the ego has of itself. They therefore become subject to repression. They do not disappear, however. They continue to function as an unseen alter ego which seems to be outside oneself. In other words, as the shadow. Ego development rests upon repressing the wrong or evil and furthering the good.
the ego cannot become strong unless we find, unless we f- learn collective taboos, accept super ego, and persona values, and identify with collective moral standards. It is most important to note that those qualities which are at this point are repressed as incommensurable with persona persona ideals and general cultural values may be quite basic to our fundamental personality structures. But owing to the fact of their repression, they will remain primitive and therefore negative. Unfortunately, repression does not eliminate the qualities or drives or keep them from functioning. It merely removes them from ego awareness. They continue as complexes. By being removed from view, they are also removed from supervision and can thereby continue their existence unchecked and in a disruptive way. The shadow, then, consists of complexes, of personal qualities resting on drives and behavior patterns which are a definite dark part of the personality structure. In most instances, they are readily observable by others. Only we ourselves cannot see them. The shadow qualities are usually in glaring contrast to the ego's ideals and wishful efforts. The sensitive altruist may have a brutal egotist somewhere in himself. The shadow of the courageous fighter may be a winning coward. The ever-loving sweetheart may harbor a bitter shrew. The existence of our necessity for a shadow is a general humor archetypal fact, since the process of ego formation. The clash between collectivity and individuality is a general human pattern. The shadow is projected in two forms, individually, in the shape of the people to whom we ascribe all the evil, and collectively, in its most general form as the enemy, the personification of evil. Its mythological representations are the devil, ar- arcanemy, tempter, f- fiend, or double, or the dark or, or evil one of a pair of brothers or sisters. The shadow is a constituent of ego development, It is a product of the split which comes about through establishing a center of awareness. It is that which we have measured and found wanting. It approximately coincides with what has been regarded as the unconscious, first by Freud, and now rather generally, namely elements repressed from consciousness. In unconscious spontaneous representations, The shadow is usually personified by a figure of the same sex, as the dreamer. Recognition of the shadow can bring about very marked effects on the conscious personality. The very notion that the other person's evil could be pointing at oneself carries shock effects in varying degrees, depending upon the strength of one's ethical and moral convictions. It takes nerve not to flinch, from or be crushed by the sight of one's shadow. And it takes courage to accept responsibility for one's inferior self. When this shock seems almost too much to bear, the unconscious usually exerts its compensatory function and comes to our aid with a constructive view of the situation, as in the following dream. Uh, Somebody wanted to kill me with an apple. Then I saw that a neighbor of mine, whom I do not regard very highly, had managed to turn a rocky, a red plot of land, which I considered quite useless, into a beautiful garden. This dream presents the shadow problem in two ways. First, in archetypal terms, and then in individual terms. To the apple, the patient associated the 
notorious apple of the first chapter of Genesis, the devil's present. The unknown person treating him with a devil's or snake's gift constellates an archetypal form of the shadow, the general human fact that everybody has to deal with a shadow problem. The actual neighbor whom he looked down upon represents the personal shadow. The dream says, in effect, you are afraid that the shadow, that in you, which offers the apple, the discrimination between good and evil, the hence the awareness of the temptation of the evil in you, will kill you. And indeed, by eating the apple, man came to know death. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. But the apple also signifies the implication, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 5. The dream, therefore, points to the fact that this personal problem, which is so shocking to him, is a general, fundamental, human, hence archetypal, problem. The confrontation of one's own evil can be a mortifying, death-like experience, but like death, it points beyond the personal meaning of existence. It is important for the dreamer to realize this. The second part of the dream says, it is your own shadow side that in, that in you, which you find unacceptable, namely uh, those qualities which you associate with a neighbor you despise, which takes an arid, unsatisfactory area and turns it into a paradise. The shadow, when it is realized, is the source of renewal. The new and productive impulse cannot come from established values of the ego, when there is an impasse and sterile, and sterile time in our lives, despite an adequate ego development, we must look to the dark, hitherto unacceptable side which has been at our conscious disposal. Goeth in his faust, has the devil say of himself when asked, Who are you then? That he is part of that power which would the evil ever do, and ever does the good. Part of that power which would the evil ever do, and ever does the good. The reverse of this statement is also true, that often enough, the more we will the good, the more we create the evil, by overlooking our selfish intents or disregarding the evil. For instance, when we become professional do-gooders. And this brings us to the fundamental fact that the shadow is the door to our individuality, insofar as the shadow renders us our first view of the unconscious part of our personality, it represents the first stage toward meeting the self. There is, in fact, no access to the unconscious and to our own reality, but through the shadow. Only when we realize that part of ourselves which we have not hitherto seen or preferred not to see, can we proceed to question and find the sources from which it feeds and the basis on which it rests. Hence, no progress or growth is possible until the shadow is adequately confronted. And confronting means more than merely knowing about it. It is not until we have truly been shocked into seeing ourselves as we really are, instead of as we wish or hopefully assume we are, that we can take the first step toward individual reality. When one is unable to integrate one's positive potential and devalues oneself excessively, or if one is identical, for lack of moral stamina, for instance, with one's negative side, then the positive potential becomes the characteristic of the shadow. In such a case, the shadow is a positive shadow. It is then, actually, the lighter of the two brothers, 
in such a case, the dreams will also try to bring into consciousness that which has been unduly regarded, the positive qualities. This, however, occurs less frequently than the too hopeful, too bright picture of one self. We have this bright picture because we attempt to will ourselves into collectively acceptable patterns. There are several kinds of possible reactions to the shadow. We can refuse to face it. Or, once aware that it is part of us, we can try to eliminate it and set it straight immediately. We can refuse to accept responsibility for it and let it have its way. Or, we can suffer. It is a constructive manner as a part of our personality which can lead us to a salutary humility and humanness and eventually to new insights and expanded life horizons. When we refuse to face the shadow or try to fight it with willpower alone, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, we merely relegate this energy to the unconscious, and from there it exerts its power in a negative, compulsive, projected form. Then our projections will transform our surrounding world into a setting which shows us our own faces, though we do not recognize them as our own. We become increasingly isolated. Instead of a real relation to the surrounding world, there is only an illusory one. For we relate not to the world as it is, but to the evil, wicked world which our shadow projection shows us. The result is an inflated, auto-erotic state of being, cut off from reality, which usually takes the well-known form of if only so-and-so were such-and-such, or when this will have happened, or if I were properly understood or appreciated. Such an impasse is seen by us because of our projections as the ill will of the environment, and thus a vicious cycle is established continuing ad infinitum, ad nauseam. These projections eventually so share our own attitudes toward others that at last we literally bring about that which we project. We imagine ourselves so long pursued by ill will, that ill will is eventually produced by others in response to our vitriolic defensiveness. Our fellow men see thin as unprovoked hostility. This arouses their defensiveness and their shadow projections upon us, to which we in turn react with our defensiveness, thereby causing more ill will. In order to protect its own control and sovereignty, the ego instinctively puts up a great resistance to the confrontation with the shadow. When he catches a glimpse of the shadow, the ego most often reacts with an attempt to eliminate it. Our will is mobilized and we decide, oh, I just won't be that way anymore. Then comes the final shattering shock when we discover that, in part at least, this is impossible, no matter how we try. For the shadow represents energically charged autonomous patterns of feeling and behavior. Their energy cannot simply be stopped by an act of will. What is needed is re rechanneling or transformation. However, this task requires both an awareness and an acceptance of the shadow as something which cannot simply be gotten rid of. Somehow, almost everyone has the feeling that a quality once acknowledged will, of necessity, 
have to be acted out. For the one state which we find more painful than facing the shadow is that of resisting our own feeling urges, of bearing the pressure of a drive, suffering the frustration of, or pain of not satisfying an urge. Hence, in order to avoid having to resist our own feeling urges when we recognize them, we prefer not to see them at all, to convince ourselves that they are not there. Repression appears less painful than discipline, but unfortunately, it is also more dangerous, for it makes us act without consciousness of our motives, hence irresponsibility, irresponsibly. Even though we are not responsible for the way we are and feel, we have to take responsibility for the way we act. Therefore, we have to learn to discipline ourselves. And discipline rests on the ability to act in a manner that is contrary to our feelings when necessary. This is an eminently human prerogative as well as a necessity. Repression, on the other hand, simply looks the other way. When persisted in, repression always leads to psychopathology. But it is also indispensable to the first ego formation. This means that we all carry the germs of psychopathology within us. In this sense, potential psychopathology is an integral part of our human structure. The shadow has to have in its place of legitimate expression somehow, sometime, somewhere, by confronting it, by confronting it, we have a choice of when, how, and where we may allow expression to its tendencies in a constructive context, and when it is not possible to restrain the expression of its negative side, we may cushion its effect by a conscious effort to add a mitigating element, or at least an apology. Where we cannot or must not refrain from hurting, we may at least try to do it kindly and be ready to bear the consequences. When we virtuously look the other way, we have no such possibility. Then the shadow, left to its own devices, is likely to run away with us in a destructive or dangerous manner. Then it just happens to us, and usually when it is most awkward. Since we do not know what is happening, we can do nothing to mitigate its effect, and we blame it all on the other fellow. There are also, of course, social and collective implications of the shadow problem. They are staggering, for here lie the roots of social, racial, and national bias and discrimination. Every minority and Every dissenting group carries the shadow projection of the majority, be it Negro, uh, White, Gentile, Jew, Italian, Irish, Chinese, or French. Moreover, since the shadow is the archetype of the enemy, its projection is likely to involve us in the bloodliest of wars precisely in times of the greatest complacency about peace in our own righteousness. The enemy and the conflict with the enemy are archetypal factors, projections of our own inner split and cannot be legislated or wished away. They can be dealt with, if at all, only in terms of shadow confrontation and in the healing of our individual split. The most dangerous times, both collectively and individually, are those in which we assume that we have eliminated it. The shadow cannot be eliminated. It is the ever-present dark brother or sister. Whenever we fail to see where it stands, there is likely to be trouble afoot, for then it is certain to be standing behind us. The adequate question, therefore, never is, 
Have I a shadow problem? Have I a negative side? But rather, where does it happen to be right now? Where, when we cannot see it, it is time to beware. And it is helpful to remember Jung's formulation that a complex is not pathological per se. It becomes pathological only when we assume that we do not have it. Because then it has us 